Hello, my name is Juan Santiago. I'm a professor at Stanford University, and I'm happy to give this talk today at the Third International Conference of Microfluidics, Nanofluidics, and Lab on a Chip. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizers, uh, in particular, Professor Yongan Zhu, uh, for inviting me uh, for this plenary talk. It's uh, my honor to give you this talk. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen show you my title slide. So what I'd like to do is tell you about some of our work on microfluidics um, for the use of uh, detection of pathogen RNA and DNA. Um, we are using CRISPR technology, these uh, enzymes, as a diagnostic technique um, uh, to detect the RNA of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, which is, of course, the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. My co-authors are shown here. Uh, I'll focus on some of the work uh, by my student, Ashwin Ramachandran, and this is part of his PhD thesis, but I'll also show work and contributions from Dago Hoike and Jared Nesbitt, Dr. Jared Nesbitt, who's a postdoc in our group. Um, my collaborators in this work uh, the other PIs are Nias Banayi of the Stanford Med School, as well as Benjamin Pinsky, and um, uh, Dr. Sahu and Huang are uh, postdocs who uh, are research scientists, rather, uh, at Stanford, uh, who work with uh, Pinsky, and uh, Dr. Sharma is a postdoc in the med school as well. So this is an outline of my talk. Um, I'll first give you a very broad introduction to CRISPR diagnostics. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some work that we did in analyzing the kinetic rate measurements um, and performing some of our own kinetic rate measurements on CRISPR enzymes. Um, so the talk is really about our work on microfluidics, but this particular part of the talk um, is applies to all CRISPR diagnostics, and we've performed some basic studies of CRISPR kinetics. Uh, we have some um, items to share uh, uh, there as well. Next, I'll introduce the concept of using on-chip electric fields to control and accelerate biochemical reactions. We use a process called isotachophoresis. Um, it's a method of increasing and focusing select species by their mobility. And then I'll show you our work. I'll summarize some of our work on detection of the RNA SARS-CoV-2. We do that by amplification using isothermal amplification followed by CRISPR detection. And then I'll show you some of the ongoing work that we have around CRISPR detection to make these systems um, more automated uh, and more integrated. So this is just a very brief overview of CRISPR uh, kinetics uh, and CRISPR diagnostics. Um, CRISPR, of course, stands for clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. It refers to a class of uh, enzymes. You may be familiar with these from work on gene editing, but there's a uh, newer and, and, and uh, fairly separate um, efforts uh, going on with these um, CRISPR enzymes around using them as tools for molecular diagnostics. And the matrices and the types of targets um, uh, that, are, uh, that are being uh, looked at include things like viruses, bacteria, fungus, uh, parasites, but also things like tumor cells and, and people are looking at cancer markers. So the way these work, I'll just summarize these. The yellow blob here is our depiction of, uh, as an example, this Cas12A uh, uh, enzyme, which uh, is used to directly detect DNA. The enzyme is functionalized with a synthetic guide RNA, which is shown here with this loop structure and this red um, uh, portion here. The loop structure uh, uh, shown here is specific to the enzyme and the red is a reconfigurable portion of the synthetic RNA, which is complementary to the target of interest. And so we're using this, for example, to be complementary to several genes on the 
uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus or uh, amplicons resulting from the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. So the way it works um, is there's basically two steps uh, to these assays. If the enzyme first very selectively, very specifically, um, recognizes the target. Uh, the target can be single or double-stranded. We're showing here a double-stranded. It'll cut the target. And thereafter, a piece of the target stays on the enzyme and the enzyme becomes activated. And we show this activation of the enzyme in blue by just coloring it in blue. The assay then also incorporates, the mixture also incorporates synthetic reporter molecules. So these are just short oligos with a fluorophore quencher pair because when the enzyme becomes activated, it indiscriminately begins to cleave any nucleic acid, any DNA in this case for Cas12a. Um, and so once it cleaves uh, indiscriminately, so non-specifically, once it's been activated, the subsequent cleaving is non-specific. And so you get a linear amplification of signal, um, right? You wait twice as much uh, time and you get twice as many fluorophores uh, so long as the fluorophore concentration um, it, uh, hasn't yet been depleted. And that's what's shown here in the last box is some cleaved uh, reporter molecules with the fluorescence going on. This is some example measurements uh, published from this Chen uh, paper in Science, um, but the original uh, sort of uh, uses of CRISPR diagnostics uh, go back to about 2017. So with that, um, I'd like to first introduce you to some of the basic studies that we've done on the physical chemistry, and in fact, some of the limitations of CRISPR, of the sensitivity of CRISPR. So we, we believe uh, CRISPR offers very high sensitivity and convenience of producing this fluorescent signal, um, but in fact, it has limited sensitivity, and we're, we're going to uh, try to convince you of that today. So these are two example uh, CRISPR-Cas enzymes. The one on the top is the one I just discussed or the type I just discussed, which is Cas12, um, uh, the Cas12 family of, of these enzymes, which target DNA. And on the bottom is the Cas13 um, uh, family of these enzymes, which target directly RNA, okay? But in both cases, you use a uh, synthetic guide RNA. That happens in both cases. In both cases, there's an initial highly specific called cis cleavage uh, recognition of the target. It cuts the target, it becomes activated. And that's what's shown in the box here in this particular slide is the activated enzyme um, cutting, um, uh, non-specifically cutting reporter molecules to produce fluorescent signals. So um, I want to highlight two basically seminal papers in this CRISPR enzyme kinetics um, uh, field. Uh, on the left is this um, uh, paper in science from 2018 um, with uh, Janice Chen as first author, Jennifer Dudna, uh, Nobel Prize winner, was the uh, communicating author, senior author on this paper. And they were the first to measure the CRISPR enzyme kinetics of any kind in, in the entire field. Um, they measured and reported a KCAT. This is the catalytic conversion rate of the enzyme. Um, this is probably the most important parameter to uh, determine sensitivity to uh, trace molecules. This and the KCAT divided by KM, which I'll, I'll discuss later. But this is one of the most important parameters uh, for sensitivity. And they reported a value of 1,250 turnovers per second. So you can imagine the activated enzyme uh, turning over uh, over 1,000 uh, reporter molecules per second. I would say a second and very important uh, seminal paper in this area was the first paper ever to demonstrate uh, or measure and report the kinetic rates of Cas13. 
And this is that CRISPR-Cas enzyme that directly targets RNA. Um, so the paper on the left was uh, Berkeley, uh, led by Berkeley group. The paper on the right was led by an MIT group with uh, Feng Zhang as the communicating author. Um, and they reported uh, a KCAT that was similar to that uh, of, for Cas12 uh, in magnitude. It was a KCAT of a thousand turnovers per second. And I'm, I'm gonna refer back to these. These um, numbers, if they were correct, would be extremely um, encouraging for the design of kinetic rate, uh, of the design of diagnostics. Uh, because again, these numbers, the kinetics of these enzymes directly determine the possible sensitivities and therefore they have an immense influence on the applications. Okay, so one of the first things we did was to develop a uh, fairly simple um, numerical model around michaelis menten kinetics uh, associated with these CRISPR-Cas enzymes. Um, in particular, we looked at the transcleavage uh, portion of the assay. Um, the cis cleavage is thought to be, and we think correctly, thought to be uh, a very fast process. So the rate limiting step of the diagnostic is this transcleavage. I box in here the typical uh, michaelis menten kinetics model. Um, the box here on the upper right shows the uh, activated enzyme, um, the substrate, which is uh, S here, um, uh, the equilibrium or the uh, forward and back rate with the uh, complex uh, with the reporters and then the catalytic rate conversion uh, cutting reporters um, in creating the product, which is the fluorescent species and, and the detection. As per the typical michaelis menten um, um, approximation, we assume that the reverse rate and the catalytic uh, is much larger than the catalytic rate so you can think of this complex uh, state, this concentration of this complex uh, to be approximately constant. Under that assumption, we can write the rate of production of the product, which is uh, termed the velocity of the reaction, in terms of the catalytic conversion rate, the Km, which uh, here depends on, on both the forward and reverse rates of all, all the kinetic rates shown here. Um, as well as the substrate concentration. Um, it's also interesting to look at a, a further limit, not the typical michaelis menten but a further uh, specialized regime where the Km, this uh, dissociation constant, is much greater than the substrate, the initial substrate concentration. In that case, you get this uh, sort of first order self-limiting, um, uh, first order exponential for the rate of production as a function of the substrate concentration, where the time scale of the completion of the reaction um, is as follows here. So related to the Km and the KCAP. Now, we, what we did is we did uh, numerical models and some scaling analyses, which I'll describe next. But one of the first things we did is compare our simulations to published data. And here's just one example of that. This is uh, to the data in the Berkeley group. This is uh, the seminal paper I described earlier, the first to present kinetic rate measurements for CRISPR. And what we found is, is a gross discrepancy between our model um, and, um, so this is our model based on their reported values for the kinetic rate constants. Um, and we compare here versus their raw data. So this is fluorescence versus time. And they're showing for, for example, for two micromolar concentrations, that the increase of fluorescence is still well in the linear range where our model predicts that for that same concentration, we're well out of the linear range in 20 seconds. So it's 20 seconds versus 400. So we saw basically a gross discrepancy between our model and this published seminal paper. Um, we then started comparing our model to all the published data in the entire CRISPR kinetics field. And in all but uh, one of the 10 published papers in the entire field, we also saw gro gross discrepancies. So this prompted us to then start doing our own measurements of the CRISPR kinetic rates. And I'll just summarize some of those for you. But on the left here, 
is sample raw data, right? When you're taking these CRISPR kinetic measurements, you tend to uh, start with substrate concentrations that are both lower and higher than the particular value of Km, which you don't know uh, ahead of time. We uh, perform these measurements uh, mostly concentrated on Cas12 uh, enzyme. Um, uh, we're plotting here reaction velocity. This is the rate of production um, as a function of substrate concentration for both double strand and single strand. You see, we see small differences. We also looked at different guide RNA because the sequence of the guide RNA itself um, has a significant but not uh, extraordinary um, uh, influence on these kinetic rate constants. You see here maybe a factor of one and a half or so. On the top right is the um, uh, uh, regime. So the, the circles here, uh, everywhere, the circles and squares and triangles are all experimental data. And we're comparing here experimental data that has been collapsed by this time scale that I mentioned earlier um, associated with the regime um, where S0, the substrate, initial subsequent concentration is much less than Km. And there we see this first order self-limiting exponential. Um, and, and we see that, that it works very well. The, the initial uh, slope of this equation normalized for time is a non-dimensional reaction velocity, which, which I also mentioned. And then here is a collapse of data due to the scaling from our model. So in addition to the standard nonlinear model, we looked at simplified scaling analyses that result from these equations. And we use the scaling analyses to collapse experiment, our own experimental data across various concentrations and various, um, uh, and two different guide RNA, but also different targets. Here's double-stranded versus single-stranded DNA. So what we did with this model then and these scaling analyses is to then form and report, and this is the paper where they're reported, uh, came out just a few months ago, where we form and reported a set of validation criteria to check CRISPR enzyme kinetics data, both published data uh, from other groups, as well as to check and validate our own data. Okay. So on, on the left here, we're showing this classic cleave reporter concentration versus time, where the initial period is linear. Then on the right, we're showing this initial reporter concentration, and on the y-axis is the velocity of the reaction that in the uh, Michaelis-Menten uh, kinetics, that velocity, if you remember, is equal to kcat e naught s uh, and, and this uh, grouping of the substrate concentration Km. So for example, when the substrate concentration, the initial substrate concentration um, is very low, then this velocity scales with kcat over Km, but when it's very large, um, this tends toward unity and the velocity scales with k-cat. And that's, that's what happens here at, at high concentrations. So given these simple uh, 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 type model for Michaelis-Menten, we extracted a set of validation criteria based on things like conservation of mass and kinetic rate measurements. We call them alpha, beta, and gamma. The first one is basically a conservation principle that the amount of substrates you measure can't be more than the amount of substrates you, uh, you put in, okay? So the amount of cleaved reporters can never exceed the amount of initial reporters that, that are uncleaved and you insert into the reaction chamber. The next is one around the fundamental rates of this velocity. This velocity can never be larger than the value of kcat times E naught. This is a fundamental limitation of the kinetics. And lastly, the time scale associated with this linear portion um, uh, must be limited by this grouping here. Um, and I'll, read you, I'll refer you to this paper for details, but it's a grouping involving kcat and km and that linear time scale. Interestingly, for example, this parameter, you don't need to um, have a calibration from the uh, 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 of the fluorescence signal versus the concentration of the reporter, you just need to be able to uh, look at the graph and, and estimate the, the linear time. So many of these are, are very easy to, to go and compare to uh, 
um, either your own data or published data. So what we did is we compared or, or we looked at these validation criteria for all the published kinetic rate measurements, okay? And we're showing here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine uh, in gray, and then there's a 10th one here. The, the last four rows here are our own work from the paper shown here. But what we saw is all but one of the 10 or so kinetic rate measurements ever published in the entire field of CRISPR show gross violations, gross violations of basic principles, gross violations of uh, physics and chemistry. Um, so for example, these entries here, um, this includes uh, work from this um, MIT group, the initial published data had reported 10,000 times more reporters than the initial amount that went in. Um, and this, for example, this linear uh, timescale in this nature communication papers, this thing should be less than unity, than order unity. And in fact, it's 68,000 is, is the number. So what do we do with this? We, we communicated our um, findings to uh, uh, many of these uh, authors in these collectively, in, in these papers. Um, and so far, two of them have responded. And the two that responded, in fact, are the two seminal papers in the entire field. So I'll refer you again to this paper from the Berkeley group, the first ever to publish KCAT of 1250 for CAS 12. And then the paper from the MIT group, first ever to publish um, uh, KCAT for CAS 13, which directly targets RNA. In both cases, um, and to their credit, um, they took our communication very seriously and, and, and re-looked at their data, reanalyzed their data, and in the end agreed that uh, there was some major discrepancy in their, in their data. They described a couple of sources of errors that led to this and published now two errata, so two corrections of their data, which were prompted um, by our uh, uh, validation criteria and our communication. And um, I just highlight here, so here um, uh, they, they thank our uh, lab for pointing out this discrepancy and, and here in the MIT group, uh, this is Berkeley group and here in the MIT group, they, they uh, uh, call up uh, both my name and uh, uh, Ashwin Ramachandran, his name, my student, um, uh, 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 and thank us for, and so we very much appreciate their um, uh, acknowledgement. So given this updated estimates of the kinetic rates, as well as our own uh, measurements of the kinetic rate, we started looking at, okay, what's possible to do with CRISPR enzymes? And this is what um, uh, I, I said at the beginning of my talk, which are their, their sensitivity limits on CRISPR, Cas12, CRISPR, on all CRISPR enzymes, rather, all known CRISPR enzymes. The plot on the left is a uh, theoretical plot that we made with our experimentally validated model, where we plot target concentration on the right versus the initial reporter concentration uh, on the x-axis. Sorry, not the right, the, uh, the ordinance here, and initial reporter concentration on the x-axis. And then the colors are the fraction of cleaved reporters, right? So ideally, you want a significant fraction of the cleaved reporters um, so that you can get sufficient fluorescent signal over the background. And it's important to note that these reporters have significant background. So before any single reporter is cleaved, there's a fluorescence measurement. If you then cleave every one of them, you get an increase of fluorescence of only about a factor of 30, on the order of 30, okay? So the background is very important. That's why you need a, a significant fraction, say 10% or more, uh, we believe, uh, of cleave reporters. And what we, uh, the contour on the left, to be a conservative, we publish basically the highest value of KCAT KM of the corrected data. So this is the correction by the group in Berkeley. Uh, the correction occurred in 2021, which I showed you. Um, 
And then we also consider in our estimate here a 60 minute assay, right? A 60 minute assay with no preamplification. What we see is that if the initial target concentration, right, the initial target of the assay is um, say less than um, a, a picomolar, uh, so in, in this range here, you would get very small fractions, say 1% a uh, fraction after uh, 60 minutes. And if the range is less than 10 femtomolar, uh, the, 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 after 60 minutes, the fraction gets even smaller. Now, the minimum report or the, the best ever reported, reported sensitivity in the entire field is this paper by Fozouni uh, in Cell published in 2020. This is again, a, a Berkeley group. Um, uh, is 80 atomolar, uh, 80 atomolar for a 30 minute assay. So 80 atomolar is below this 100 atom, uh, atomolar level. So it would be down here. So we expect after 60 minutes, uh, you would have extremely low, right? Compared to that strong background, extremely negligible amount of cleave reporters. Yet they're uh, reported a successful detection in this paper, and also uh, corroborate the kinetics of their experiment. They go back to the Chen paper, which is the one shown here. Sorry, not the Chen paper. They go to the Slaymaker paper, the MIT paper, to corroborate the kinetics. But we know now that those were off by a factor of a thousand. So they're sort of corroborating their data. Uh, yet it's uh, off by a factor of 1,000, which we cannot explain. We believe that for this initial concentration, it would take over 40 days to get something like 0.1% of the cleave reporters. Okay, lastly, uh, we believe target concentrations um, of order 10,000 copies per microliter or lower are, would be extremely difficult uh, to detect with any detector in any situation in a 60-minute assay for either of these enzymes. Okay, so with that, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, I'm going to finish now on talking about basic CRISPR kinetics. And the, the takeaway here is CRISPR is highly specific, but its sensitivity is very limited. And there remains some discrepancies in the, in the, in the literature. So please be careful uh, in interpreting. I think we should all be careful in interpreting these. Next, I, I want to introduce you to this process known as isotacophoresis. We use it to purify, to mix, and pre-concentrate not just nucleic acid, but all kinds of species, including nucleic acid, uh, the target, reporters, and enzymes into a, a focus zone. ITP uses a two-buffer system. Here I'm showing the leading electrolyte, which for us is typically chloride. And then the trailing electrolyte is the red ions here. It has relatively low um, effective, uh, low magnitude mobility. We use uh, a weak acid like heaps, buffer acid. Uh, everywhere the, the system is buffered by uh, a weak base like tris. When we apply an electric field, we choose the trailing electrolyte to be faster, uh, sorry, to be, yeah, to be faster than impurities but slower than the target reagents of interest. And so we're showing here the target reagents in the different colors of green, and we focus only those. We selectively focus while leaving other things behind. For example, we might selectively focus an enzyme, but leave behind impurities from a nasal swab sample, which is uh, depicted in orange. For our work uh, with CRISPR-Cas, we're in fact focusing CRISPR-Cas 12. Um, and so we're focusing all of the species in these two reactions where we have the um, highly specific reaction of the target for, to create activated enzyme and then the activated enzyme uh, uh, catalytic activity on the reporters. All of these species are focused in here. We know they're focused by over a thousand fold, including the enzyme in just a couple of minutes. We've in the past shown that we can increase reaction rates by 14,000 fold, that's this paper. And in this more recent paper, we applied it to CRISPR-Cas12. We show over 1,000 fold increase of just the enzyme and uh, more for the um, 
uh, nucleic acids, which have higher mobility and accumulate faster. Okay, and, and we use this to drive, right? We're stuck with these uh, limited kinetic rates, but we increase concentration to drive the chemical reaction. And this is example results from that paper that I mentioned here. This is an experiment where we're switching back and forth from two filter cubes. The red filter cube is showing the, uh, the enzyme and guide RNA complex. The uh, produced signal, the cleaved reporter, has a green um, reporter, and that's shown there. This is the spatial temporal diagram, so all this is experiment on the top half. Uh, it's time versus distance. And here we're switching at each of these horizontal white lines, we're switching between one filter cube and another to show that they're strongly co-located. They're strongly correlated. There's a, a slight shift between them, but there's significant co-location of the enzyme and the reporter showing that this whole reaction vessel in isotacophoresis focusing um, is there. Um, so let me show you about some of the work that we did in using this to detect SARS-CoV-2. So this is the assay that we published in this paper in 2020. Um, the, we take a nasal swab, we use ITP. So it was a, basically a three-step assay. The first, ass, the first step was five minutes, 20 minutes is the second step. Steps, third step was five minutes. We first posted this assay in May, 2020. So uh, after just a few months after the uh, COVID-19 lockdowns. And we demonstrated uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA from raw nasal swabs. But let me tell you about the assay now. So you take nasal swab, raw nasal swab, and we use isotacphoresis on a chip to extract and purify all nucleic acids, including the RNA from the enzyme. For this initial work, uh, we took a pipette, extracted it, went into a standard tube. So there's a manual step here in this arrow went to this tube where we perform reverse transcription and lamp, isothermal lamp amplification. Um, we can do that with the N gene and the E gene. Uh, we can also amplify a human gene as an internal control for the assay. We then took the lamp amplicons, which is now DNA, went back into the same chip, same chip, uh, and we do isotacophoresis accelerated CRISPR reactions to get a highly specific signal and then do the on-chip fluorescence detection as the ITP zone uh, travels under uh, um, uh, the detection region. And that's what's shown here in the schematic are the first step and the third step. So this is that first ITP step and then this is the third. Um, we're now working, uh, just to jump ahead to the end of this talk, but we're now working on integrating this whole thing on one chip. But let me tell you about what's possible with this. The first thing that's possible is analysis in 30 minutes, uh, easily 30 to 40 minutes uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, samples. These are two movies. On the bottom is a positive, uh, uh, with a white background here, is a positive sample, uh, positive for COVID-19. And on the top is a negative sample, where, and you can barely see, but on the top is a negative sample. So there's very little background fluorescence but finite background fluorescence in the ITP zone. And these three example data that we show here are for the P gene, the N gene, and E gene. Um, uh, this P gene is the human uh, internal marker. And then we have the N gene and the E gene for the virus versus the negative controls, which are much lower here and, and, and stay low. So just to show that this ITP works, we also took data. This is all experimental data again showing uh, the strong linear type increase expected from the CRISPR kinetics this is the CRISPR component. This is data with calibration before and after ITP all done on a chip to show that we're pre-concentrating this enzyme by at least a thousand fold, by at least a thousand fold um, in the ITP zone. So all of these different species are being focused in the ITP zone. Okay. Um, Lastly, I'll show, this is data from raw nasal swabs, just like it is in the, in the square here. Here's more positive and negative control examples. But again, this is starting from a raw nasal swab from a patient, uh, ITP for purification, then LAMP, um, then lastly, ITP for CRISPR kinetics um, diagnostics. I'll just summarize this work uh, with these data. 
Uh, on the left is data from 32 patients which showed positive for COVID-19 um, using the WHO uh, real-time PCR test. And on the right is 32 healthy donors um, who showed negative for coronaviruses as well as flu. Um, so the, and for all of these, we applied our isotacophoresis CRISPR type detection, uh, including lamp preamplification. So lamp, uh, sorry, ITP purification, uh, lamp uh, and, and, and CRISPR, we're showing here the lamp application and, 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 and uh, ITP, so the whole thing. Uh, on the left, uh, on the left is um, the uh, 32 patients uh, with COVID. We we're able to detect successfully in all of them, except two, which for which we got false negatives, and these two happened to be the ones with the highest CT value. So these had only very trace amounts of the the virus. Um, the number was something like uh, larger than 34 cycles in the PCR. Um, the, on the right is the healthy controls. There we got no false positives, all negatives showing the very high specificity. So here's a limited uh, sensitivity of our assay, uh, although fairly good, and then very good specificity for our assay. And, and I'll refer you to this paper for details. We're now doing ongoing work around CRISPR detection in an in integrated chip. And I'm just gonna show you some very preliminary data but this is our very simple, after creating some other more complex chips, we've decided on this more simple chip involves four wells, uh, a small well here, and then three larger wells where we perform in a single chip, all automated in, uh, once you do the loading. Uh, we perform extraction and purification of RNA. We then do reverse transcription. We then do lamp isothermification, and then the electric field automatically transfers to the reaction zone, and then we can do uh, the fluorescence detection. Uh, we, of course, use lamp for the sensitivity and CRISPR for the specificity. And here are the various portions of the assay. We have the, the raw uh, sample uh, loaded in this region. We then extract and purify the nucleic acid and simultaneously do lamp um, uh, in lamp here before on the left to, of this center well we do uh, reverse transcription in lamp and then on the right portion of this we do CRISPR uh, kinetics and for now uh, it's around 45 minute assay so this is unpublished work and let me show you just some very preliminary work we first did this independently uh, first showing that we can use ITP to simultaneously purify, do reverse transcription and LAMP all in one process, all ITP, uh, all happening uh, at the same time. So again, purification, reverse transcription, and LAMP isothermal amplification all happening in one step. Um, and, and data for that, so here, for example, we took it off chip, we do a, um, a bioanalyzer, Agilent bioanalyzer, and we see that after ITP lamp, we see this characteristic fragmentation pattern of lamp amplification. Um, we also did experiments where we separately analyzed the CRISPR portion, and we found that it's, uh, this CRISPR assay portion is very sensitive to pH. We hypothesized that this has to do with the mobility of the enzyme itself and how well you can co-locate it and focus it in the ITP zone. And now this is our most preliminary uh, results our latest results where we integrate the entire thing in one chip with no manual intervention after loading of, of all of the things. So we show here for comparison, a positive off chip signal uh, where we do off chip uh, um, uh, reactions and, and CRISPR. And then the rest of them are all on chip and we're showing here the negative control and then the very sensitive temperature dependence because there's a, a little bit of dual heating associated with these uh, channels. So with that, I'd like to summarize. We've presented and published a set of validation criteria and discovered some astounding uh, discrepancies in the literature. So we encourage you to uh, be careful in how you read this literature. Um, we've, um, we've, we conclude that CRISPR offers very high specificity, but limited sensitivity, particularly for things like pathogens and viruses.
Um, we've developed methods to affect purification, reverse transcription, LAMP, and CRISPR, all on a chip using isotacophoresis. We developed this 30 to 40 minute SARS-CoV assay, but involved with manual steps. And now we're working toward remove, removing these manual steps in an integrated chip. I'd like to thank uh, Ashwin Ramachandran uh, for his work uh, on these uh, on these topics. And, and uh, I'd also like to thank uh, postdoc Derek, uh, Jared Nesbitt uh, and, and my student Diego Heike, our collaborators, uh, uh, Benjamin Pinsky and Nias Banayi. And I appreciate funding from Ford uh, Motor Company around these uh, microfluidic uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 detection, as well as Stanford BioX program. Um, which is funding some of this more recent integrated um, uh, assays. Thank you.